Good morning. Uh, first things first, huge thanks and job well done to Vishal and to all the other speakers, Vishal organizing, uh, Jonathan helping out with emceeing and everyone. Uh, a lot of work went into not just planning the conference, but studying and arranging all of your, your lessons and everything. So good job. You know, when you were saying in the first lesson, I think actually Jonathan was saying this, that, you know, we want to retrieve these things. It's not just for scholars. It's also for the laypersons. I said to Brandon next to me, I said, it makes you so happy. <laughs> Brought it to me all it did. So I'm very, very pleased, very thankful, and very honored to be a part of this and really looking forward to it. I, I had such a struggle thinking what, what to do, what to do uh, for this conference. And so I finally, finally landed on... Basically, I want to do the footnotes of the previous lectures where you've, give, you've been given the life of Benjamin Keach and, and the, the big things in his life, theologically, the hymn singing controversy, uh, justification, covenant theology, tropologia, and all these things. And so what I can offer that is perhaps a little bit unique is some of the sources that we, that we have that allow us to say the things that have already been said in those lectures. And so if, if you just skipped the chapter in a book and went straight to the end notes, which of course end notes are, are evil, but if you did that and just read the end notes, it would kind of be okay, somewhat disconnected things with raw information. And so this presentation will, will contain a variety of somewhat disconnected things, but it's the raw information that we use to say the things that are said in the, in the previous lesson. So the, the point of this is to deepen our connection to Keech and his world through an examination of contemporary sources because it helps you to connect to him in a, in a visual way. Oh, I remember what that looks like. And so it helps me to remember not just a mass of information, but also another level of connecting to, to those things. So, for example, Keech was not just faced with ideas as opponents, but people and who were they and what can these sources teach us so I hope to just help you, help confirm to you some of the things you've already heard and to deepen your connection to those things. So going back to the title page, uh, you can see here this is a title page from the Horsley Down Register. And I'll come back to that in just a moment, but I just wanted to read it to you. You can see how it, it mentions here the congregation that meeteth on Horsley Down over whom Benjamin Keach is overseer. So we're dealing with, with real raw sources from the t life and times of Benjamin Keach. And so the, there's two main sources uh, that we'll look at briefly as well as some other things. We have in the National Archives in London, you can go visit London, you can go see uh, for yourself many of these things. It's free open access. We have a register of births, deaths, and marriages from the Horsley Down Church. And this would have been important because you, you're not baptized, you're not christened in the parish church, and so there's no parish, there's no record in the parish register of you existing. <laughs> and so the dissenting churches, the nonconformist churches, would often keep their own registers, which included their own births, their deaths, and their marriages. You can find most of the particular Baptist deaths recorded in the parishes because they, uh, they're buried, but you will oftentimes not find their births because they're not baptized. And if you can often find their marriage records as well. This is a rarity. It is not often that you can find a 17th century register of births, deaths, and marriages. So it's really special that we have this, that we have the Horsley Down Register. And then we also have the Mays Pond Church record book. And the Mays Pond Church is the church that broke off, that broke out of Keech's church and formed their, their congregation based on strict non-singing and non-associating with those who did sing. And that church book is not so much births, deaths, and bap or births, deaths, and marriages, but rather the church business, the things that they discussed, etc. And we have more of that kind of church book. We have Hercules Collins' church, church book, the Devonshire Square, that's William Kiffin, the Petty France Church, that's Cox and Collins. So we have many church books, but not very many registers from those churches. And so I want to, to look at these things a bit with you. But before we do that, as everyone has done, we kind of need to set the stage. And I want to give you a visual understanding of what London was like and where the particular Baptists were located within London. Because you hear all these names, Devonshire Square, Horsley Down, Southwark, etc., etc., but you have nothing to connect that to other than listing the information in your head. And so I hope that this will be uh, somewhat helpful to you. So right now you're looking at London and Westminster. London and Westminster. 
It's easy to think that this whole thing is London, but your left, yeah. On the left-hand side over here, that is the city of Westminster. And so that's why Westminster Abbey is there. Uh, and that is where the royal residences would be, the, the houses of parliament, of course, Westminster Abbey. And then London itself is the main mass on the north of the Thames. And south of the Thames is Southwark. It, it looks like Southwark, and I called it that, and my dad said, oh, it's actually Southwark. So you, you never know how to pronounce the things when you go there. You just have to be wrong and get corrected. That's the way, that's the way I learn. Uh, so on this map of London, we can show you several things. I have highlighted in red circles uh, various of the famous churches. So the top two that are close together, the one on the left is Petty France. And the one just to the right of it is Devonshire Square. So the, the Nehemiah Cox and William Collins Church was very, very close geographically to William Kiffin's church. And they're just outside the city walls, the old city walls of London. So the parish that they are located in is called Bishop's Gate Without. Because right in between them is Bishop's Gate and they are outside of the London Wall, so the parish there is Bishop's Gate without. And then the one that's on the Thames, on the north side down here, that's where Broken Wharf was, and Hansard Knoll's church would have met there, and that's where the first uh, particular Baptist General Assembly would have been held in 1689. And now you may notice that there's only one bridge to cross the River Thames. That's London Bridge, of course, which if you... Uh, Brother Mike put a picture up that you could see the, the London Bridge, and there's these like lollipops sticking up from the gates of the bridge, which is, of course, decapitated heads of the traitors uh, to the crown and king of England. And so whenever you'd walk across London Bridge, you would see the rotting corpses of the enemies of the state. Uh, if you wanted to cross the Thames any other way, you had to take a boat. And so watermen... Uh, would ferry you across. Westminster Bridge that we know so well today had not been constructed. So it was either a boat to take you across or London Bridge. And then if you look off far to the right, on the north side of the Thames, this is where Hercules Collins would have been in Wapping. And then Benjamin Keach's church is the last one that we have here. So Horsley Down was in the parish of St. Olive's in Southwark. Uh, very close to um, St. Mary Model in Bermondsey, which uh, my father-in-law and I and my, my parent and our, my father and our wives stayed at last year, which was really fun. So this is an idea of the geography of the particular Baptists in London and Benjamin Keach in relation to them. So he's on the southern side of the Thames, a little bit isolated geographically, but he could pretty easily just walk up to London Bridge and cross the bridge. They, they did that kind of thing all the time. You will notice, however, that most of the particular Baptist churches push to the east of London. They push that way as most nonconformists did because it's further away from the, the government heart over on the west side of London and Westminster. So you're, you have more freedom. The government can't reach quite as far into those thicker parts of London, though those were generally the, the poorer parts, though the particular Baptists... Baptists were not, uh, really not poor. They had some poor among them. But. So this gives you an idea, idea of the geography. Just a couple other things to point out is Bunhill Fields would be on the edge of the city on the north side. And uh, William Collins also lived in Southwark, actually, in St. Saviour's. So they're, they're spread out all over the place. Collins is living in Southwark but ministering on the north side of the Thames, uh, and you'd have people living on either side and traveling throughout. They, they moved all the time, and they, they had no problem doing so. They didn't have a million cars on the road with smog like we do uh, here in Southern California. So this gives you an idea of how to picture London in your mind and how to picture Benjamin Keach and Horsley Down in relation to the other churches. And Petty France, Devonshire Square, there are many other churches, but these are the main ones that we know well. So now we're going to zoom in. And just to give you an idea of where we're zooming in, let me go back. We're going to look at this, this area here in the next slide. So you can see the River Thames. You can see on the north side is the Tower of London. And then you cross over, and you can see 
well, we haven't, we haven't quite zoomed in quite enough yet. We'll, we'll come back to this later, but you can see both Maze Pond and Horsley down right now. Maze Pond is on the left, and Horsley down on the right. So we're specifying where we are across from the Tower of London. Now, we zoomed in more so on that, and you can see St. Olive's Churchyard on the left, and then Horsley down right through the middle. And Freeman's Lane, right here, Keach lived on Freeman's Lane. So, again, it, it gives us a, a visual uh, connector to Keach and his church and his life. So now that we have that in mind, think about something that was brought out several times. 1689, life's good for the particular Baptists. The Act of Toleration gives you freedom. You've organized your first particular Baptist General Assembly. The Horsley Down Church has been settled since 1672. That's when they built uh, their meeting house. Things are good for them. And we have, um, in, the, in the Horsley Down Register, we have a list of signatures uh, before the records begin from that point onward. And so it's dated uh, the 14th day of March, 1688-89, uh, and Benjamin, Benjamin Keach is the pastor, if you can read that. And then there's the teachers, the gifted brethren, including Daniel Mills. <laughs> it's a Mills family affair during this conference. Uh, just, just a couple things by way of history and uh, paleography, reading old handwriting and, and such things, as well as old dates. Why, why would it be dated 1688-89? And, and the reason for this, you may have heard uh, from me or from others before, is that the, the way the calendar worked back then was differently than the way the calendar works now. Because Jesus was thought to be born on December 25th, the date of his conception nine months previous would be March 25th. And so the new year began on March 25th. And so March was regarded as the first month. And once you realize that, it helps you to realize why our months are named the way they are. If you count from March, March, April, May, June, July, August, September is the seventh month. October the 8th, November the 9th, December the 10th month, January the 11th, and February the 12th. And so this is March 14th. So for them, it's still 1688, but most of them treated January 1st as the new year. And so they would write it both ways, the calendar year and the... Um, I guess the public, the public New Year, 1688, 1689. And then why spell Benjamin with an I? And you may know or may not know that J, the, the letter J, is just a long I. And when you write two I's next to each other, you write the regular I, and then you write the long I after it, the J. And so Benjamin, it, it is the same letter. If you read old Primers like Benjamin Keach's on teaching children how to read. The alphabet will not have H-I-J. It'll just have H-I because J is the same letter. It's just a longer form of the same letter. Uh, if, you, if you see a name like Meyer written M-E-I-J-E-R or the, the I and the J become a Y in cursive, you just take the dots away. So just a, a couple things that are different then from what we know now. On this list, you can see the people that we're going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, you can see Luke Leader. He was mentioned. Uh, you can also see John Leader, his brother. And Edward Sanford. We'll come back to these names. But before we come back to those names, I just wanted to point them out because we'll keep going. I want you to see what the register actually looks like and tells you incredible details that researchers just love to find this kind of thing because it's, it's things you would never know otherwise. So it goes through births, and it seems that they gave the book to each family, and each family filled in their own details because the handwriting changes, and you can see the leaders did the leader part, and Keach did the Keach part. This is Keach's writing. Benjamin Keach, son of John Keach, and Joyce, his wife, was born at Stoke Hammond in Buckinghamshire on the 29th of February, 1640. So he was born on the leap year day. So uh, Keach was not very old when he died as a result because uh, his birthday only came up every, every four years or so. So it gives you wonderful information, where he was born, the date, who his parents were. And then later it gives you both of his marriages. Benjamin Keach married Jane Grove, 1660, Susanna Partridge, 1672. And you notice there the second marriage uh, married by Hansard Knowles. 
And you see the spelling of Knowles there helps you to understand how they would have pronounced it. When you read it other ways, it's not so clear. And then, of course, boo, hiss, evil, Isaac Marlowe. Uh, this is the birth of his son, Isaac, uh, Isaac born to Isaac and Esther, 1688. And it gives you such details at 11 o'clock at night in the town of Richmond in the county of Surrey. Uh, so if we go back to our, to our London map, Surrey would be even further south of Southwark, heading, heading down that direction. So somewhat removed from London proper. Now, Remember that I said we want to connect a bit to the real-life sources and what was happening in Keech's church and in Keech's life through these sources. And you saw previously that Luke Leader signed the, that 1689 list of members in the church. It wasn't all of the members. It was some of the members in the Horsley Down Church at that time. And his brother John Leader was also a part of the church. They were soap makers of St. Olive's in Southwark. Remember, St. Olive's was the parish church there. The parish is named for it. It's right next to Horsley Down, so they live right where the church is. And the leader's uncle, Henry Grigg, had been an elder at the church. In fact, Henry Grigg owned the register book that was then given off to others to use after Grigg died in the late 1670s. So your uncle, Luke's leader, Luke's uncle, was an elder in the church. His father-in-law, who also signed that uh, that sheet was Edward Sanford, and his brother-in-law was Isaac Marlowe. So Luke Leader's sister Esther marries Isaac Marlowe. Another one of his sisters, or no, his wife, Luke Leader's wife, uh, her father was Edward Sanford. And Luke Leader, it seems, was a record keeper because the register is written mostly in his hand, in Luke Leader's hand. And then when they go to the Mays Pond Church, Luke Leader is writing all of the entries. Uh, for that church as well. So if he was the record keeper in May's Pond, and if the register before that is mostly in his hand, you assume he was the record keeper in Horsley Down as well. So in the heart of the church, you have a family situation with, with close family connections. And so if you read the accounts of how the hymn singing controversy went down in even more detail than, than Dan gave to us, Dan did an excellent job, if you look at all of the tiny little details, you'll see regularly that Luke Leader and Edward Sanford and Isaac Marlowe were the big problems in the Horsley Down Church, and they were a family unit. So if you're arguing, you know, Luke and Isaac and Edward, they can all be getting together all the time and saying, well, did you hear this and did you know that? And what do you think about this? You know, they're, they're going to be promoting things amongst each other when, of course, it's no problem for families to get together. It's just the point is you can understand more so how difficult it would have been to deal with these situations for Keech when you're, when you're dealing with someone whose uncle was an elder, someone whose father-in-law is also in the church, whose brother-in-law is Isaac Marlowe, and you're a record keeper. He's a record keeper. Luke Leader is a record keeper in the church. And so it, it just adds a dimension to, the, to understanding what Keech had to face as he was navigating the hymn singing controversy in his own church. It doesn't seem to have been an, exclu an exclusively family affair, though, because it seems that John Leader, uh, Luke's brother, disagreed and did not, uh, did not take his brother's side. So I guess that was perhaps some encouragement to Keech, perhaps, uh, the Mays Pond book opens after their um, articles of faith. It then goes through a long history of everything that happened. And it, it, it's, it quotes Keech at one point where he says, Brother, you, you had as good take a, take a knife and stab me in the heart. Uh, Keech took these things very, very seriously. But it was personal. It was personal. There's family issues going on here, not just theological issues. Now we can go back to a picture previous and see that the Mays Pond Church did not establish themselves very far away at all. This is Horsley Down, and then on the left is Mays Pond. So the Mays Pond Church uh, constituted by 1694, as Dan said, after they tried to join one of the other particular Baptist churches, and that, that didn't work out. They established their own congregation, and this is one of the, these are the first signatories after their Articles of Faith, uh, Sylvanus Heathcote, had, his name was on that previous one in the Horsley Down Register, and he shows up here. Edward Sanford, first, second name. Luke Leader, fourth name. Uh, Isaac Marlowe at the bottom of that first list.
So you see the, the family unit has left Horsley down and brought with them many others. Uh, Sarah Leader is on the opposite column. Esther Marlowe is on the opposite column. And so you can see how a, a core group from Horsley down removed themselves, the, who had been right there with Keach previously, but they, they departed. And then I want to, to just give you a few other reinforcements regarding how, <clears throat> how vehement and venomous the controversy about him singing became. Just to reinforce what Daniel said, which was really excellent. Have you ever wondered why it is that the, the London Baptist Confession was so widely used, widely appreciated, widely accepted, widely agreed upon, but Hercules Collins' Orthodox Catechism wasn't. It, it's the Heidelberg Catechism. Who doesn't like the Heidelberg Catechism? It's like the greatest catechism that was ever written in the world. So who wouldn't like it? Well, one of the difficulties was that Hercules Collins included in his version of the Heidelberg Catechism, he took specific stances on hymn singing, on laying on of hands. He included a polemic against infant baptism. Uh, I don't remember if he addresses uh, baptism and church communion, but he included his particular views in a known context of issues in, in his version of the Heidelberg Catechism, whereas the Second London Baptist Confession ignores or, or is at least broad enough to handle the differences in opinion on the contentious issues. And you can see this from something Isaac Marlowe said about the Orthodox Catechism. He said, in the year 1680, about 10 years before the printing of the first part of my treatise concerning singing, Mr. Hercules Collins published a book entitled An Orthodox Catechism with an appendix concerning singing, wherein vocal singing is asserted to be the public duty of the whole church, which for want of an answer to it has been brooding among us for so many years. So to, to some particular Baptists, in a context where the majority of them are not singing, an Orthodox Catechism is considered to be brooding. At least that's Marlowe's terminology. But it helps us to understand in the context why that book did not have in any way the same kind of traction or dissemination that the, the confession did. They couldn't agree on it. They couldn't unite on that document. Well, what did the Baptists think about Isaac Marlowe? Uh, two things to note. First is that Marlowe was at the Mays Pond Church, but then eventually moved away, and he wasn't a member in any church. And so in that second phase of the, of the hymn singing controversy that Dan did a good job of describing, it did go in phases. In that second phase, when things blew up again, there was nothing that could be done about Marlowe. He wasn't in the area. He wasn't in a Baptist church. There was no mechanism that the Baptists in London could appeal to to try to apply some kind of accountability to Marlowe. They said there is no remedy in a church way against the said Mr. Marlowe, he being at present no member in any of the baptized churches in and about this city or elsewhere. There was nothing they could do. And then it's eternally ironic to me that they said, but this we hope will be the fate of his writings, that they will be buried in oblivion, that a part of this age, or at least the next, may never know we had such a man amongst us. And it's eternally ironic because the hymn singing controversy gets covered from time to time and written about and Marlowe's writings, therefore, and his carriage, the way he, he behaved himself, uh, are regularly brought up uh, time and time again. But it gives you an insight into how they felt about these things. Uh, her, copies of one of Marlowe's books were handed out at William Collins' church building. Uh, you know, like, come on, man. Play nice. So I, I hope that that gives you a, a deeper connection to what was happening in Keech's church. The difficulties he had to face were not just the ideas about him singing, but also personal relationships that would have complicated how to handle and how to navigate these things. And if you're in pastoral ministry, I'm sure you've bumped into that yourself to some degree, uh, in perhaps in positive ways. Sometimes families back things up in a good way, and the strength of, of core families can be an asset. It can be a blessing. And at other times, it can be a difficulty that is, is very uh, difficult to be redundantly redundant. So the next thing I want to point out that the Horsley Down Register helps us to see is just the, the difficult realities of life in the 17th century for a particular Baptist pastor, for any pastor, not just particular Baptist, uh, as illustrated by the life of William and Hannah Allen and their family. So William and Hannah Allen were married on the 28th of October, 1684, members of the Horsley Down Church. All of this information comes from that register. And they had, they had many children, William, 
Hannah, Sarah, Rebecca, Hannah, Benjamin, Sarah, William, William. And you think, well, why did they keep naming their children the same name? And sadly, it's because their children were dying. And you can see there on the right-hand side that William, Hannah, Sarah, Rebecca, Hannah, Benjamin, uh, they, they all died. And they died very young. And sometimes the age at which they died sort of coincided with others. So if you look at the first three, it takes pl- three, three children die for this family in the space of less than 12 months, from November 1689 to March uh, 1690. That would be out of or uh, well, it's it's in order based on the births. But if, so I guess from June 1689 to March 1690, uh, three of their dear little ones uh, passed away, and then later two two of them died in September 1692. These are the same years that Keach would have been dealing with uh, the hymn singing controversy, and of course there are other families in the in the parish in the church register book who also have children who pass away uh, during this time. So Keach would have had a lot to deal with and people to help and to care for, uh, entirely independent, completely separate from the hymn singing controversy, you know, deep and difficult things for these families to endure. And it helps you to understand, like was mentioned by uh, Zach, that Keach's teaching on the covenant of grace was pastoral to to reassure uh, believers of their salvation in Christ and and such things. And so it just gives us a glimpse into what he would have faced as a person, uh, as a man in that time, uh, under those circumstances. And then just a few instances of Keats showing up in other church record books. I didn't take this picture, so don't blame me for the blurriness. But uh, I had I didn't know, or maybe I'd forgotten, but I, when, when Mike mentioned that Keach was robbed on his way moving to London. I thought, that's hilarious, because he was robbed again later. So here, on uh, December the 25th, 1679, Christmas Day, uh, the Hercules Collins congregation at Gravel Lane says, December the 25th, 1679, the congregation in Old Gravel Lane did then raise and give three pounds, five shillings, to Brother Benjamin Keach when he was robbed the sum of three pounds, five shillings. And then they signed their hands, you know, we've, we've done this. So they raised money for Benjamin Keach uh, because he got robbed in 1679. Get, get a pistol, Keach. I mean, <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. What's the deal? And then this is the Petty France Church. Well, <clears throat> they moved out of Petty France and the church... They moved, and then after they moved, the church split. Some stayed in the place they moved to. Some moved to Turner's Hall. The, there was a split over singing, really, and the, the non-singers went to Turner's Hall. So this is the Petty France Church, the group that went to Turner's Hall, their records. And in 1717, uh, it says 1716 slash 17, but that means 1717, the Church of Christ meeting in Turner's Hall, London, having taken it into consideration to have an interest in the baptizing place at Horsley Down, did to that end advance 10 pounds towards repairing of it, uh, which, which accordingly was paid by Mr. Thomas Dewhurst, their pastor, and received by Mr. Benjamin Stinton, who succeeded Benjamin Keach. So the Horsley Down Church built a baptistry, uh, and the particular Baptist churches in general would use it. Previously, they would use the River Thames or... Uh, something we'll come to next and come back to, the horse pond. <laughs> uh, and so when the, when the Horsley Down Church built a baptistry, it was expensive to build, it was expensive to maintain, and so the other churches would help out in keeping it up so that they could use it. Early on in the Petty France Church book, they say, uh, baptism was deferred because of the present frost, that we could not come into the water. Uh, it was frozen over the River Thames. So they were glad to have something like a baptistry in the Horsley Down Church. It was, the point of this being, Uh, Not just that this church shows up in associational life, but in in some ways it would have been a hub as people came together and used that building and its baptistry. I don't recall exactly when it was built. I believe in the mid-1690s. I didn't take the time to track that down. Uh, Next, uh, Brother Mike mentioned that Keach was accused of baptizing in a horse pond that the filth of the stable runs into. And in the Rector Rectified, there's actually a whole section of people who, who certify, we have, we have looked at the pond, <laughs> and it's not dirty water, and they say, you can see here, what do they say? Um, 
we find the dung or filth of the said stable runs the quite contrary way from the pond. (laughs) So they're like, yeah, there is dung and filth flowing out from the stable, but it doesn't go towards the pond. It goes into the street. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And they say, we certify that the people that were baptized there, they came out uh, without the least speck or spot of dirt or filth upon their clothes. And then below this, they all sign it. Of course, it's printed their names, but they, they're saying, we, we sign our names. So it's kind of ridiculous that he had to have published something like this uh, just to, to re- reinforce uh, what, what Brother Mike said accurately. It's pretty funny to us. And then as we just bring this very close to a conclusion... Uh, Right here, you'll see the last will and testament of Benjamin Keach, uh, which is fairly interesting. And what is most interesting about it is that he signed it the day that he died. Uh, As as Mike said, July 18th, 1704. I'll zoom in in just a second. You can see here, if you can read that, it says, um, My will given under my hand and seal the 18th day, the 18th of July, 1704, and the third year of, of Queen Anne's reign, etc. So July 18th, 1704. And compared to his other signatures that we have, this is a rather weak one. You can see that he indeed was, he knew that he was close to death. We could go back to his previous signature and, and see how it was much more boldly and cleanly written in the, in the past. Now, did you know that you can go visit one of Keech's churches today? You can go visit Keech's chapel, the, the chapel that he preached in, in the country before he came to London still exists, the very chapel, and the, it's been somewhat modified, but overall it is the exact same building that was used by Keech back then, and it's funny, it's, it's not the kind of thing that's going to be kept up by the National Trust and have, you know, a board of tourism running it or anything like that. It's, it, it says, you know, go to this address and they'll give you a key and you can go over there for yourself. Uh, there's no facilities there. There's no electricity. There's no bathroom. You know, please leave it the way you found it and bring the key back when you're done, basically, Monday through Saturday during these hours. So if you want to go and have an authentic experience, they'll let you in uh, and you can, you can have a good time in, in Keech's Meeting House, you know, party like it's 1689. <laughs> But uh, I've never been there myself. I'd like to. Most of what I do is centered in London, and so going out to this chapel hasn't been something I've been able to do yet. They describe it as Keech's Meeting House is one of the few remaining dissenters chapels of the 17th century and externally has survived in a virtually unaltered state. The inside, they said a, a gallery, you know, a, a balcony basically was installed at some later point, and you can, it's still there, so that's different. But the, the communion table is a 17th century communion table, and I would love to get there someday. So if you go to that website, you can see the details for yourself if you're interested. So I hope that that was helpful in just giving you a, a deeper connection, like I said, to Benjamin Keach and his life, seeing London, seeing the, the, the distribution of the churches geographically, seeing the Horsley Down Register, its, sig- its list of signatures, seeing a, a portion of those signatures show up in the Maze Pond opening pages, seeing the family relationships that were a part of the complexity of dealing with the hymn singing controversy within Keech's church, seeing a little bit in the sources of just how vehemently they felt about hymn singing, Marlowe describing the Heidelberg Catechism basically as brooding amongst us because of what Hercules Collins included in it, seeing the Baptist saying, we hope that people don't even know that Marlowe existed, uh, etc. And so it just gives more reinforcement and, and deepening of our appreciation and understanding of these things. So we'll conclude there, and thank you very much.